rest of you guys get that. <laughs> Have to be careful going this way slow unless we want to try to step step aside. Which way you guys want to go? Try to pick it up and over. You want to come over up this way? Straight over. Or just you want to go. we can walk it down. Yeah, we can walk it down. Walk it down. Go slow. We need a couple guys here. Anybody? You guys may just walk your bike. You guys want to help? <laughs> help us stay out of the way. Help me help you. Thank you. 
I, I got this end, you guys don't worry. <laughs> Here and back then, but I can still do that. Yeah, why don't you do that? I just didn't know where we were at. That's not fun.
this way? Straight over just you know, we'll go. We'll walk it down. I, I got this in, you guys don't worry. I'm <laughs> gonna walk it down. I, the trail. I know you guys are trying to help Tommy out, but. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 that. Oh, yeah. Oh, good, young guy. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I have your attention though. What I was told when I came here just about a few minutes ago was that these particular fires, we should not throw anything else other than the wood that they're putting in there because plastic and anything else may create some kind of a problem. So we just have to have the rocks and the wood um, in the in the fire. Is that what is that what you said? You want to do that? At, you have it ready to go when we. Yeah. When we uh, do the draw. Yeah.
get you to, um, first of all, just tell me your name and spell it for me so I can make sure I have that title right. Okay, every little while, <clears throat> I'm going to need to catch my breath. That's okay. Because you know I've got to... If that, if that happens, just, just pause, okay. take a break till you're ready, and I'll cut out any dead, okay. dead space. So don't worry about that at all. all right. time. You, can, you can just do whatever you need to do. All right. Okay, name's... Steve Brown, S-T-E-V-E, -E, brown like the color. Okay. So, could you tell me, describe kind of the process that we're, that you're going to go through here to steam this canoe? Okay, well, um, this isn't the end of the process, but you could say it was the climax. And um, this is based on a, that old Aboriginal technique that allowed the ancient carvers to make a canoe that's bigger than the log they started with. So the obvious uh, conservation of effort there is a valuable one. Although one might wonder, how'd they ever think of that? You know, and. Uh, it really is remarkable that uh, people, whether it was um, envisioned over time or came in a dream all at once, we don't know, but um, uh, it's been done that way for many long years. So at this point, the hull of the canoe is designed to, to do two things, to fit within the shape of the log to start with, and so it has to be confined by that restriction, but at the same time, it has to anticipate this change that's going to take place. And it's, it's a very dynamic change, and one that um, I think is difficult to fully understand until you actually do it. And whether you do it on the scale of a model or a small canoe, you know, 10 feet, 12 feet, or a big one, if you're uh, ambitious, um, it, it's, it's really a fascinating concept even. I, I've done this a little over a dozen times now over the years, and I, Part of me still can't believe it's actually possible. But what happens right now, the canoe is shaped as I mentioned, so that 
when the shape that was confined within the log is sort of let loose, uh, then the shape that it will go to is the shape that you would carve it to if you weren't doing this process. So if you're making a model or a smaller canoe and you're able to carve it to shape, that's the shape it wants to end up at. And it's much easier said than done. So right now it's thin. It's particularly thin on the bottom. People would be surprised sometimes to know that uh, even the biggest canoes, there's a 44 foot one in the Smithsonian, a 65 foot one in New York City, and they're inch and a half thick on the bottom. You might think that's awfully fragile, but there's an important point there. And the sides are about an inch thick, and they get slightly wider or thicker as they go toward the bottom. And right now the bottom, rather than being straight, has a reverse bend in it. The bottom actually bends upward. If you get back, you can see that. It's only about this much bend, but it's significant. And the thing is that in order for the sides of the canoe to bend out, the ends physically have to get closer together. It won't happen otherwise. The ends can't get closer together unless the bottom flexes. And people who haven't realized that leave the bottom thicker, thinking about wear and strength and all that. And then they wonder why the sides won't go out, see? So that's an important consideration. And as the, since most of the change takes place in the middle of the hull, as the sides and the bottom move toward each end, they get a little bit thicker for strength and all that. But the center has to flex. So right now, we're um, awaiting our water supply. And uh, we've got two fires going with uh, a collection of the best possible rocks we could uh, ever have gotten right from the volcano out at Mount Edgecombe. And we've prepared some little uh, wire mesh baskets so that when uh, the rocks are all red hot and the water is in the canoe, we only need enough water to just really cover the rocks because steam is hotter than water. So with just minimal water really. And um, then we'll use those baskets to transfer the rocks into the water and then cover the canoe up and let the steam generate itself. And the first couple of loads of rocks only make a dent in the water, you know, it's going to be cold when it goes in. So they'll raise it up to warm and lukewarm. But by about the third and for sure the fourth load of rocks, then we've got real boiling. And by the time we get to the fifth, sixth, seventh load of rocks, because I think these ones will recycle well. Sometimes the rocks break all the pieces, but um, hopefully not these. And there comes a point because of the distance between the supports on the bottom, then all the weight of that water and rocks pushing down in the middle, that wants to force the ends up. And again, the ends can't go up unless the sides go out. So as soon as the sides are limber enough because of hours of steaming, then they'll start to bend all by themselves. And in fact, if we keep adding more rocks and steaming, the sides will bend out to their, their goal shape all by themselves. And then we just need to put cross sticks in to hold that shape and to steer it a little bit in case there's any irregularity in the curves and all that. So we don't really 
We don't need to put any pressure on it to get it to open. It'll open all by itself. And that's what we want. So when it's ready to go, it'll go. And then, um, then when, the, when we attain that optimum shape, um, we just have to sit back and let it cool. And then when it cools, it's just, it's done? Well, at that point, we would cut and fit the seats, the thwarts, and they get tied right into the hull. And then um, <clears throat> just little finishing details, and then uh, a little paint job. Here comes our water machine. Perfect timing. Yeah. And then, uh, and then at that point, the basic canoe is finished. Yeah. Wow. How many of these have you done? I've worked on thirteen of these, but that's over a it's over a forty-year period, and it's a small number compared to some people. I know a carver down on Vancouver Island. His name's Joe Martin. A friend of mine, and I bet he's carved more than anybody. I mean, it must be up in the over 50, 60, 70 canoes. He's really prolific. But at any rate, um, I've always tried to reach toward a uh, standard that the old timers established long ago. There are so few old canoes to learn from, but the ones that are there are significant and you can really get a lot of information from them. And so if I can, I'm still, I, I don't think I've ever attained that goal of uh, the true standard of the old timer, but I keep trying. Can you tell me about why this is important? Well, I think that even as an outsider to the culture, it's so apparent that uh, the canoes were a central part of it. And they couldn't have, people long ago couldn't have done what they did to survive without them. And I, if, out of respect for that alone, I think it's important to to try to keep up the skills that those old timers had so that for one, you really know what they were. And because it's really easy to think that this is an easier task than it actually is. But it's also important that people feel like they're standing in the shoes of greatness. People who did great things. And I think that can do a lot for a person's sense of identity, self-esteem, and all that kind of stuff. So that's just a couple of reasons. I'm sure there are many more that people could come up with. Yeah. You guys have anything to uh, ask throw in there? I'm just, I was just winging it, you know? <laughs> all right, well, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Put your name and spell it for me so if yeah. I get a title off how Okay, Jared Galanin, J E R R O D, G A L A N I N. Okay. Um, tell me why, um, why did you get involved in this project? I, <laughs> I got involved in the project. I, I, I guess I applied for it and was selected. Uh, I think I was selected because of uh, my experience. I went to a uh, wooden boat building school in Port Townsend in uh, 2001, 2002. Um, my experience with uh, Northwest Coast Art, other projects, woodworking projects, and other projects I've been involved in. and. Uh, I guess also my family history. My the last canoe that was 
that came out of Sickles 20 years ago was done by my uncle, Will Burkhart. And 50 years ago, my great-grandfather designed the, the canoe that was before that. So I, I like to think that's one reason I was selected. Why did you want to do it? This, this is a dream project. I, <clears throat> Been, this has been a long road, this project, and getting getting to here is almost unbelievable already. Um, I wanted to do it for a lot of reasons. I, my passion for boats, boat design, boat building, woodworking, and my, my culture, my Klingit culture. Can you um, kind of describe to me where, where you're at right now? I know you guys are taking some measurements. And yeah. Where, you, where you're at now and where you're kind of well, I'm not sure where we're, exactly where we're at now, but we're about we're hoping to spread the hole uh, 14 to 16 inches. And last I checked, we we're at seven and one half inches, and everything is going smoothly so far. And we hope it continues to go smoothly. What are some of the things that uh, some of the difficulties you might have to deal with in a, in a project? Uh, well, some of the difficulties we've had on this particular project was dealing with uh, splits that were in the log and um, imperfections, knots, and some rot. So we did a lot of patchwork and uh, dealt with a lot of that. Uh, How do you, what kind of work do you do to patch something like that up? Yeah, sorry, what's that? Uh, what, kind of, what kind of work do you, what, kind of, what do you do to patch something up, like if there's a split in it? Yeah, uh, there's two different ways to do it. Uh, one is was a kind of a Dutchman, like a butterfly type Dutchman that went uh, perpendicular to the, to any splits, any like hairline splits. And uh, the shape of that acts like a wedge and will hold against the, the crack getting opening wider. And then also uh, we use modern adhesives and, and techniques to fit pieces in uh, either end of the log where there were much more damage and it was just a painstaking uh, fitting process where you hold it up and shave a little off and continue to get the best fit that you can get. So you said you went to a boat building school in like 2001. Yeah. Um, how is this type of project different from like maybe ones you worked on when you were going oh, to school? It's a whole, this is a whole different it, it doesn't compare at all. The, the, the amount of time and skill and knowledge and intuition that goes into a project like this, it, it, you won't find that in any, as far as I'm concerned, any of the woodworking or wooden boat projects. Not to say or make light of wooden boat building, but this is like absolutely like no other, and, and the difficulty involved is to a higher level, much higher level. How important is it that you get everything just right when you're doing this? Um, I know they were talking about one of the important things is to know when to stop. What, no, no when to stop. No when to stop the oh, streaming process. Yeah. Well, we, we have a measurement that we're aiming for, and so we're checking that. And then also, we've uh, the gunnels are have been leaned in and tilted in, out of level, and when we, what we think is when we get to the beam, the, the width that we want, that they'll sit level. And so that's another check we can do and know when to stop. So kind of, you said you, you've got, you know, somewhere around seven-ish, seven to eight inches spread so far. What, what, what's the rest of the process? Kind of walking through what's gonna happen from now on until it's finished. We're gonna keep stoking these fires and, and replenishing the hot rocks and building steam and heat. And we're gonna keep checking it and uh, for the next few hours, keep doing it until we reach the point one. That's, of course, not my specialty as this is my first project ever. We're gonna default to what Steve says and listen to him, so yeah. So when he says we're good, what do you guys do then? Uh, good question. I, I, I imagine we're gonna pull the rocks out and, and uh, we got spreader sticks that will cut and fit on the inside of the hole that, that's gonna continue holding it so that when we pull the water out, it doesn't wanna flex back and that's gonna hold that 
eventually when we put the thwarts in, those will be permanent fixtures and that'll replace the temporary spreader bars we're gonna put in there. Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, thank you so much. Is there anything else about this project that you'd just like to let people know or? Um, it's, been a, it's been a very uh, long road and very challenging. And uh, there's been a lot of, we're, we get a lot of credit for the work we did, which was a lot of work. We all have put a lot of work into it and for the last nine months. And there's still some stuff to do. But really, our, our, my fiance and my family, and I probably the same for all the other guys, have uh, people that are backing them and helping out in the community. And they've, people have been really supportive. And so we're very proud, but, but uh, we couldn't do it without, without community. So, yeah. All right, great. Thank you. That way you don't have to worry about camera or whatever. I'll just talk to you. Um, First of all, can I get you to just give me your name, spell your name, in case we do titles up, I want to make sure I uh, right. Yeah, TJ Young is my name. Swyon is my hiding name, my real name. Are you related to uh, Archie? Uh, yeah, 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 we're cousins there. Uh, UAF. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Way back then. Long time ago, yeah. yeah. Um, tell me about why you decided to get involved in the process. Um, well, I got an email or a phone call asking if I wanted to be part of this, and I said, sure. I've always been fascinated by this, just the whole, the whole, um, the whole process, which always intrigued me. I never knew, I never, this is my first time, we're all learning here, so I jumped at the opportunity to learn this technique, carving and steaming a canoe, so I know how important they were back traditionally, too. Tell me about how long of a process this is from the How long ago did you begin that? Yeah. Well, it started in February and we've been um, dealing with a bunch of issues with the log. So we had a lot, of, a lot of cracks and whatnot to fill. Uh, a lot of time consuming uh, inlaying wood into wood, fixing cracks, uh, fixing dry rot. But it's, it's, been a, it's been a pretty long process and uh, we learned a lot through it though. It had, had its ups and downs, and uh, we're just looking forward to we're just looking forward to finishing her up here pretty soon. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, what? Now you, you said there was a lot of challenges with with the log itself. Um, can, you, can you talk to me maybe about uh, the wood itself? I, I heard you know it's not like you just go find one of these anywhere. Yeah. So if you find one that has some issues, you work on fixing, you don't just you know, kind of trash it, go look for another one. Yeah, that's, that's the thing with these logs. They they have a mind of their own. They don't care about your agenda, it doesn't seem like. And this one didn't care about ours. And uh, there's always going to be issues in any, any big project like this. And when you're removing a lot of wood like that, you're going to find discrepancies in the log. and. We call them speed bumps and whatnot. We just got to work our way through it, and that's that's what took this one, this project, so long. Um, so, um, tell me a little bit about where you're at right now in the, in the process, and what is left to get going, at least as far as you understand. Um, well, we're getting ready to steam it to its to its overall width. It's gonna, uh, it's gonna spread for us. It's already started the process of spreading the steam, softening it up. The weight in the middle is push, pushing the middle down and bringing the ends up. So it's starting to naturally just spread itself. I imagine we'll do a little bit of spreading with uh, with sticks here pretty soon. The next couple of uh, trips with the rocks, the hot rocks, and let these hot rocks do their thing. And, uh, so we're getting close, light at the end of the tunnel. It's been a long, long journey for sure. Oh, we're excited about it. We're excited about the, the things we learned, and can't wait to apply them on our next canoe. So. I was going to ask you about that. Are you, um, are you looking to do this again? Yeah, no, I'm definitely, I'm definitely looking to um, applying what we, what we learned uh, on a project of my own uh, as soon as possible. It'd be nice to get right back in it, so we don't lose anything. And um, a lot of this stuff you could, you could read. 
read about it, you could do it. Uh, there, you could you could read about it, or you could talk to somebody until you do it. I, I think uh, I think uh, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to experience. Uh, you, you get a lot through experiences. So, and we learn a lot throughout the process. And yeah, I can't wait. To, uh, I can't wait to start another one. It should be exciting. So you were you were involved with us from the very beginning back in February, you say? Yeah, I was, I was uh, asked in December or January, and said sure. I've always wanted, we've always been fascinated by these canoes. We look at old pictures. They're just a beautiful piece of functional art, you know, not really art. I mean, it's we use them so much, just like how we use cars now. So you can see how everything you want, everything to be perfect, everything to be. Um, and, and when you look at these old pictures of them, they, they really do all the lines of them. They really accent each other and complement each other and makes a beautiful fishing vessel. And, um, so there's a lot more to it than I thought. A lot more hours of work, a lot more uh, labor. You got to think out everything. You know, think out each step. You know, be careful. You can't just jump in with reckless abandon and go nuts. So it's a lot different than a totem pole. And you could, you know, a totem pole, there's a little bit more room for uh, to kind of compromise on certain things. You want, you can't compromise with this. It, you know, it has to be pretty consistent. You have to be real consistent. Otherwise, you'll end up with the you know canoe that don't float right. You don't want to sitting sideways out in the ocean. Yeah. Have you ever done anything like this before? Not not a canoe. I never never worked as my first canoe here. So uh, it's been a it's been a real journey for sure from day one. Uh, and uh, we still got we still have a lot still have a lot of work to do but it's uh, refreshing to finally steam it and get to that next step. We've been looking forward to it for a long time. And uh, like I said, we had a lot of hurdles, but um, so far, so good. It's a little bit longer than expected. No big deal. What have you got personally out of the project so far? Uh, uh, relationships with the, with, with these uh, other carvers, that's always important. You get to learn a lot about you know who you're working with, and Steve has taught us a lot. A lot of knowledge transferred the last seven months. Uh, Steve does a good job of explaining the steps, explaining the process, why, uh, why we're doing what we're doing, and uh, so I'd say I'd say I gained a lot of knowledge throughout this, and uh, a tighter bond with these other carvers, uh, Nick and Jared and Tommy. So um, it's been overall, it's been a pretty pretty good experience. I'd say. Um, and just lastly, is there anything else about this whole you know experience that you would just want to? Let people know about uh, no, I think this is a, I think it's an excellent it's an excellent project to be part of. I'm I'm really I'm really proud to be part of this project. So and I can I can't wait to um, you know like I said apply what I learned as soon as possible and then maybe one day teach a few teach the next generation that uh, the same thing that I learned here. So it's my job to hold on to it and, and transfer it when the time is right. Cool. Well, thank you so much. First thing, can I get you just give me your name and spell your name in case we're doing up titles? I'm not sure what we can get. So. Okay, uh, Nicholas Galanin, N I C H O L A S G A L A N I N. Go lay down! I want to be involved. Can you tell me uh, why, why did you get involved with this project? Uh, I got involved with this project um, to, to, to learn uh, something that's been integral to our communities and our uh, relationship to the land and our existence on on this land and water. We, um, get out of here! Get! Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know... This has always been a dream of mine to, to take part in a project like this. Uh, ever since I started working in wood and sculpture and doing the uh, customary clinket art forum, so this is this is definitely special just to, to take part in that continuum of knowledge. So. And can you tell me a little bit about the journey? When did you start doing this and how long has it been going on? What are some of the things you've run into? I started... Uh, the actual, my actual work in wood when I was about 18 years old. Uh, it's 
so almost 20 years ago, and I've since continued on into jewelry and other things. But this particular project, we started in February. So uh, this is the third canoe to come out of Sitka in recent times, 100 years or so, maybe even more. And, uh, I'm grateful to be part of it because my family's been part of those other two canoes and one former fashion as well. So it's pretty nice so to be in that lineage of knowledge. How has the project been going? Like, what, are, what are some of the things you guys have run into? Uh, it's good. You know, it's just time. Time and obviously the uh, art. Everybody's schedules and how and who and when we're able to come in because a lot of us have other uh, careers independent from a project like this. So there's five of us rotating in and, in and out of the, the job, but we've all managed to be here for, for like most of the, the steps. So things we've run into though, um, just the, the 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 log, the quality of the log, is definitely. A, um, changes things a lot, you know, historically we would have had better selection of leaves. Uh, I'm grateful that we have this log donated, but uh, commercially felled red cedar will split. Um, it's prone to more more splits than some, something that's done with a little more care. So resources, it's really important. We have to respect our cultural resources. You know, this is an 800 plus year old red cedar and um, we really need to hold on to those uh, for the next 800 years of canoes and um, I think I think that's the real challenge here so what are some of the um, maybe things that you've personally taken from being involved in this, in this project yeah. um, would you say it again? What about just, just like what are some of the, the maybe the um, personal things you've taken that you you know that, that this has given you that you that mm. from being involved in this? Yeah. Um. So much, really. Yeah. It's it's, it's gave, given uh, a lot of opportunity um, to really gain information and knowledge on uh, this art form. You know, it's it's not a very uh, common uh, art form, I'd say there's very few that create canoes in this style and uh, so it's great to try to gain some of that knowledge and hopefully pass it down to another generation. Uh, that that and the experience, uh, yeah, so much. It's, I can't really just sum it up in one one go here, but I hope to continue it and, and um, you know, just ha even having the community out here like this is huge, so we have we have a lot of people out here helping and, and, and people that have come to the project throughout the entire span of it. And uh, I think that's really important too. So. Is this something that you'd like to um, continue? I mean, after Definitely, the yeah. You know, my children were coming up here to see a lot of the whole process from February and, they're, that, and, they're, and their classmates and the schools and, and uh, that's value right there as well and, and uh, providing for these other generations, uh, higher education, I would say. But, um, yeah, I would, you know, I think it's important and necessity uh, to maintain and keep up with that. Can you talk about where you're kind of, where, where you're at right now in the process and what is kind of left to be done? Here? Yeah, we're on our third or fourth batch and I might actually help these guys out here on it real quick. Um, but, um, yeah, I should probably help them. But uh, we're steaming, putting rocks in. First off, can I get you to just give me your name and spell your name? Yeah. My name's Tommy Joseph, T O M M Y J O S E P H. Okay. Um, so, could I get you to tell me a, a little bit about why you wanted to get involved with this project? I wanted to get involved with this project because um, it's, I guess, the next step in my career. I've, I've done many totem poles and other artwork, uh, you know, 
for, for years and years, but uh, to actually be a part of a dugout canoe, I, I've been a part of other ones, but never saw one completely through. So this is my first time seeing one being steamed open, and I want to be part of that. And what has that process been like? How, how has that been? Um, very, very much learning. Uh, I mean, I, I've... Like I said, I worked on a couple before, but they're, they're all the patchwork, all the, the mending of the log itself were things that were new to me. So that's that's what I why I really wanted to be on board with this, to learn how to do all that. Um, describe a little bit about uh, in, where are we at the process right now, what is left to be done? Right now we're in our fifth course of, of lava rocks that we've pulled off the fire and loaded into the baskets and then put those into the canoe for the steaming. Um, we're, we're probably about halfway there now. Halfway, when I say halfway there, it's it's opened up about a foot already and, and we got about another foot to go. After it opens up that last foot, what, what do you guys do then? We're gonna put our spreader sticks in there so that they will keep their it, its shape and then once it's cooled down, the next couple of days we'll be putting in the permanent thwarts. Those get us sewn into the, to the canoe. The thwarts or the seats or cross boards will hold it open. What have you, what have you uh, kind of got personally from working on this project? Well, um, kind of re reconnecting with Steve. I met him when I was a teenager in Ketchikan, where I'm originally from, and he was uh, doing restoration work on a totem pole, and that's when I first got interested in doing restoration and preservation, so I do that also. Um, and so watching Steve when I was a teenager and then knowing that uh, he was come, so it was good to reconnect with him, but also... Yeah, ask him any question we wanted about about the process of doing this. We've learned a lot. So after you're done, are you um, are you thinking you may continue uh, working on things like uh, you know canoes like this? I actually have a, a 20 foot canoe in my shed at home that I started a long time ago, but I had a huge crack running down through the center of it, much like this one does, and I put it on hold because I wasn't sure what to do. Well, now I know what to do. So that's my next move is pull it out and bring it over to my gallery where I have a yard to work on it in. That's really cool. Wow. Um, is there anything else about this process that you'd like to let people know? A lot of work. Uh, if you if you take on one, well, you're gonna see it through the to the end. Just stick with it, perseverance, and you can't you can't stop. And yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry. When we uh, we had to run off there, you were just starting to tell me where we were at in the process. Now, and I guess oh we, yeah, we well, moved on a little bit. Since we have. So. <laughs> we're we're. 11 inches, I think, is what it's spread so far. And now uh, we're trying to get 16 for this canoe, I believe. So, um, explain okay. to me how that works. Like, as it spreads, what what all is going on with that canoe to make it to make it work? The bottom drops, the bottom of the hole. You know, we've the uh, <clears throat> the bow and the um, stern will lift. The bottom will drop and the gunnels will come out. The rails on the gunnels are tilted in like this, and they'll come out to be, almost, I would say, flat, so right there. Not a flat line, but they, they'll be parallel like this. So. Um, we've got a 3D scan of the canoe beforehand, and we've got a scan hope, on the way for afterwards to really highlight and see the changes that had happened with this process. So. And um, it's the, the steaming is important to make it flexible so it will do that without breaking the crack. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then we'll place place uh, some supports in there to keep it at that width. You know, we're getting a m much more seaworthy uh, canoe out of a and maximizing the log. So we found the maximum width our beam for this canoe before we carved it. And then we uh, pretty go lay down. And then we um, will ex extend that. So so the get out of here. <laughs> go lay down. What's the final uh, dimensions? Uh, I'm not sure yet. We'll find out. Yeah, we'll see what what actually changes and how much we 
we can spread it. So, um, yeah. Um, Ian, I'm trying to remember what I've asked you so far. I think I've already asked you about you know why you want to get involved and what you get in person from. Surely. Um, what is uh, kind of unique about this process? It's 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 high technology for the anticipation and design of uh, what it'll result at as far as um, and, and working with what we have and creating a seaworthy uh, canoe for these these waterways. Um, you know how treacherous our waterways can be, so uh, it's it's designed by necessity as well. I would say over thousands of years of of needing to transport and get to other communities or subsist. Uh, so yeah, this is um, definitely a reflection of that and hopefully we're giving justice to it with this uh, this canoe that we've been working on right now. So. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in what you just said there. You said it's high technology. Uh, what I, I find really interesting is that this was something that was done you know, way before you know, current technology existed yeah. and yet they figured out, like you say, it is, it is kind of high technology. It's it's really uh, an interesting process that, like, in kind of low-tech times, they were able to figure out how to yeah, do this. I wouldn't even say low-tech in a sense. I mean, I, I look at our society and how we define um, our technology now, I suppose. We've got travel that closes the world and all these other, uh, makes things much more accessible, but... Yeah. We also have like harmony and balance, and, and, and not a. Uh, we weren't digging up fossil fuels from the earth and polluting everything, and uh, so so that to me is much more. Uh, I would say it's much more civilized living than uh, in a society that damages and disrespects everything that provides form. So uh, that's a uh, relationship and understanding and valuing that relationship, I suppose. So uh, we're honoring this tree with this process. So, and, and we're, um, yeah. so it's, it's kind of the, the way they lived in harmony with their environment helped them. The way we live, yeah, certainly. I mean, we're in tune with everything. We're uh, the seasons and, and the, the um, science of uh, working with these materials and sculpting and, and creating beautiful, graceful vessels uh, or canoes that transport us safely. So. Great. Well, that's that's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, just give me your name and spell it. Okay. In case you do have title on the video. Yeah. So my name is Ryan Carpenter. R Y A N C A R P E N T E R. Okay, tell me how you're involved in this. Yeah, so I'm a park ranger at Sitka National Historical Park, and one of my main roles there is doing the education and outreach programs. And so, um, as a as a part of this project, uh, myself, uh, some of the staff at Sitka National Historical Park was able to uh, collaborate and partner with Sea Alaska Heritage Institute and the Sitka Native Education Program to develop and uh, facilitate some education programs for local youth. And so um, it was a really amazing experience to be able to interact with the artists um, and culture bearers that are connected to the canoe and to be able to share those experiences with uh, local youth here in Sitka. Um, and so what we did is we developed some programming um, kids from a, a number of different grades came down to the park um, and through a number of different stations learned uh, all about the process of the development and creation of this canoe, the cultural connections to the canoe and the, uh, the maritime cultural heritage of the native people of this region. Um, and all of them were able to develop uh, different products or projects related to the canoe. So little, some of the smaller kids, uh, first graders, were able to develop little paddles um, and some of the educators at the Sick and Native Education Program taught them form line designs. They designed uh, ovoids on the paddles. And some of the older students were able to use um, spruce root, or rather cedar bark, and weave cedar bark like it would have been traditionally done to create uh, ropes um, or um, you know, 
connective pieces for halibut hooks and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Try to angle right. myself um, the thing. Cool. So this was kind of a um, a program to get kids in the in the area involved. What what was the um, some of the reaction from kids and stuff when they, when they would get involved in this? Yeah. So I mean, there were, the reaction when they got to go out to the canoe and see it, and um, to give you some perspective, at this stage. So this was uh, in the spring. So at this stage, the canoe was. Um, I would say probably in the first third of being developed and so none of the interior of the canoe had been hollowed out and they were carving and shaping the, the bottom and the exterior of the canoe and so kids were just amazed at the progress that they've made um, and that they had made at that point um, and then also uh, just at the size of the log and one of the coolest components of it was they all developed these questions and so there's some really engaging questions about you know, the types of tools that are used or what uh, you know was the canoe going to be used for um, and how it was being made and so what it created was this really interesting dialogue between the carvers and the students that went back and forth with some engaging conversations and some uh, you know really well thought out questions by the students so they were really excited about that and then I think one of the personal triumphs of this uh, project for me was is each kid took a piece of cedar bark home with them, and so the chips from creating the canoe. And you know, as they were leaving, we told the kids that that was their invitation to come back and to see the canoe as it progressed. Um, and a couple weeks later, I'd you know walk out of my office and I'd see kids with their parents walking back to the canoe holding their cedar bark chips, saying, you know, this is my invitation to come back. And so, you know, the impacts that the culture bears had, and the cultural educators and the artists had on these students was so great that in their personal time they brought their families back and so that you know goal of passing on um, you know the, the knowledge related to the creation of this canoe from one generation to another not only was in my opinion successful during the programming itself but it manifested itself in kids being motivated to share that with their families and with their parents and grandparents and so that was really powerful. Have you ever been involved in a project like this? Yeah, so this is actually the first canoe that I've, uh, traditional canoe that I've ever seen built. Um, we've done some programming related to totemic art, um, you know, with some of the artists like Tommy Joseph. Um, but, you know, this was something that was new and different. And with the maritime heritage that's so prevalent here in Sitka, this is such an important part of the culture here. Um, and for kids to be able to see the creation, or for anyone really to be able to see the creation of this canoe, um, you know, was able to tie something that's so important to uh, our history and so important to um, the community today uh, to something tangible like the canoe. And so, you know, whether it's cruise ship passengers that had five minutes to walk up to the canoe and ask some questions and check it out, or whether it was, you know, elders that came down to visit the canoe on a daily basis, you know, the, the impacts of this project on the community of Sitka and um, really, you know, people from all across the nation was pretty big. Do you have any idea how rare these are? I, I just heard that there's not, this does not happen very often. Yeah. Uh, how many people are left that build these or how often they're built or anything? Do you, do you have any idea of any of that? Yeah, so I know that Sea Alaska did uh, a study um, and they wanted to get a sense for, you know, who within the Native community uh, and beyond was, uh, you know, trained and had expertise in carving a canoe and they recognized that the vast majority of those people um, were of, I'm going to stop and think about how I'm going to say this one. Um, I'll say that the next generation or younger generations had, uh, didn't have the experience of carving a canoe. So like, for example, Tommy Joseph, who um, is a master carver, he's carved um, you know, so many beautiful pieces of art. He's carved a number of totem poles within the park. Um, you know, it was something that um, he had not really had a chance to do um, in the way that he's been able to work on this project. And so they identified, you know, all these really amazing artists that had worked on canoes, but that the next generation um, maybe had not had that chance. And so one of the 
the goals of this project was creating opportunities for the next generation of really uh, renowned and esteemed artists to be able to have that experience. And so, you know, folks like Jared and TJ and Nick and Tommy, um, who are world-renowned artists, um, you know, got a chance to be able to be a part of this project. And so, it's passing that legacy on to the next generation. Um, and then, you know, with the manual that's going to be developed, so Steve is going to be developing a manual that's going to be available to anyone. And so, you know, that, the legacy of that and ensuring that this knowledge is preserved um, for posterity is going to be um, a huge legacy of the project. Great. Thank you so much. Is there anything else about this project that you want to let people know about? Mm, no, I think that probably okay. pretty much covers right. I was, it. Yeah. I never know for sure, so I just asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't feel like I have any other words of no, wisdom or anything. Yeah. Do you have a chance? I don't know if you'll have a chance to talk to Chuck. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. a couple it. of good pictures cool. of you. Yeah. <laughs> Martin. Hey, Martin. I'm Ryan. Yeah, nice I came to down you. to check on my... I might have sung some of these songs. Do you know these songs? I might know some. Yeah. song when the duck lady were trying to figure out where the salmon was coming from underneath the glacier they this is their story that our, we were given permission from the duck lady to tell this story but it belongs to them they used their canoe to go underneath the glacier to figure out where these salmon were coming from and they went all the way through singing this song these old ladies three old ladies and then they sang the second song because they made it through and they're very happy. And this is what the kids are learning about today. We learned about Yacht, this canoe. And so we learned these words. They, Charlie Joseph said they were once in Athabascan language, but they turned it into Tlingit language. The first verse says, push the canoe out, push the canoe out. The second verse says, steady the canoe, steady the canoe. And this is a happy song because they made it through underneath the glacier all the way. Young girl, when they.
Quarter inch. Uh, you remember what it was? 27. 27. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So I got, I got five inches bigger. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> we'll take what we get, but I was hoping for 54. Yeah, you get We might.
the canoe's going to sit between the two fires. Oh, right. That makes sense. So I got to take that into consideration. Um, to see how you represent your ancestors and how noble you are as ravens. Goodness Chief, thank you so much. This blessing here with respect to this yacht. Ye awakwatsiku Abedni Ye A long time ago, this vessel was a very valuable vessel to us as a people as we came up from the Nas and we settled this land and some of the names of the community that I mentioned, almost every one of the major communities in Southeast Alaska have been named by the Tlingit people. They were the inhabitants of this land. We look at it, we call it Tlingit Ani, Tlingit Ani Ashika, Tlingit Ani Ashika. Most noble people's land. But Kukedi means there are lessons in this for us. A canoe is not just a vessel that goes over water. It represents a people's journey in life. The journey that we started thousands upon thousands of years ago. And we're still here on that journey. We are not gone. We are not lost. This is the land of our forefathers. 
and we have been on this journey for over 10,000 years. And as this canoe was being put together, I understand that the, the people working on the canoe had some challenges as it related to the way it was coming together. They had some challenges and difficulty. The Atukhani is this for all trinket people. In life, there is no time where we don't have challenges as human beings. And the challenges you had in putting this together here and getting ready to do the work that you're going to do in completion demonstrates the power, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the determination not to quit, not to give up, but to be able to finish the work that you started. You're about to finish that. And that speaks in a lesson to all of us as Lincoln people, that the work we have before us is still with us. And we may face challenges and we may face opposition, but it's our job to complete what has been started, even as this canoe has been started and will be complete. We have this done. It's not just a vessel that you're going to travel on. It's a symbolic vessel that we are all on together. And now what I will do before the rocks are put in is what our Sunderbird people did a long time ago. And I was looking for my Thunderbird brother, but I don't see him here right now. So I guess I'm going to do this chant along with my sister Rosita here. Pahani, she's a Thunderbird as well. So I know she's going to say a few words. And so here's a, a chant that we did. And the chant when we did it, it was to take possession of. It was not giving it away. It was taking possession of. Possession of our wisdom. Possession of our knowledge. Possession of our courage possession of our vision, possession of a courage to continue on as a people, regardless of who may come and stand against us. And we say, nobody will stand against you. Society in general has demonstrated where it is, and I'm not putting it down. But we have different values and different customs. So we're taking possession of it. And if you want to, men that did this, stomp your feet because you're part of the blessing of what's happening. Thank you for it, the blessing. It goes like this. This will be our traditional thing, and then she'll speak afterwards. So. Thank you for your words. Welcome to our land. To our land, our uncles call Shitka. And it's important that we respond to you in our Singha custom. We have to give balance. My Uncle Herman, who is our leader, is not able to be here, so he sent me to speak for him as his nephew. 
and it's good that your words are not flying around now. We're going to capture them, and we're going to make sure that they're together with our own words. Uncle Herman wanted to express to the artists, the carvers, and the helpers how much he appreciates this traditional canoe. He wanted to say Gunachish to all of you. I'll translate for TJ Hawa. <laughs> That's another part of our custom is humor, and I know there's been a lot of humor around this canoe, this yak. And that's good for this community, this humor that we have. But I would like to respond in kind with a chant that my Aunt Jessie Johnny, my late Aunt Jessie Johnny, taught me, and she helped me with the words. This went with the kutia that was done over on Community Health Service Department on the island, the Welbriety Totem. She says, use these words, hagu kowe, hagu kowe, hagu kowe. We are all working together. We're all moving forward. This is the way I feel today. I'm going to counter your song with this chant that she helped me with. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you, young man. I cannot tell you how much you mean to our people, how much you mean to our future, to our survival as a people. represent our culture. At one point in time, this tree stood so tall and proud and strong on our land. That is the way that our culture was. It was strong, powerful. It allowed us to settle this land 10,000 years ago. It brought our people strength, people. There were cracks in this log. There were challenges that you had to face. But yet, like our ancestors, like the Kiksadi people, like the Slaknachadi, like the Sitkaquan people, who fought off those who would come to our land and try to take our land and try to take our culture, you prevailed. Even with those challenges, you were the ones, your ancestors, your grandfathers, your grandmothers, they were the one who withstood the challenges. No matter what people are celebrating now on this 150th anniversary, we could have a celebration of 10 year, thousand years of survival. And you artists, can you appreciate how important you are to us? You are important. You all of the artists. Where are the other artists who are here? You are important to us because you are the ones who carry the outward, outward symbols of our culture. You are the ones who make these things that are still imbued with the spirits of our ancestors. So you're so, you're powerful to us. And we owe gratitude also to those who might have come from the outside, but who are now one with us. Steve Brown, Steve Brown, who has the wisdom of our knowledge of our ancestors. He's written about it. And now he wants to return it back to us. So thank you, Steve. Thank you. 
Sitka Park, National Historic Park. They are also our partners in this project. We could not have done it without them, without Sea Alaska, without Sea Alaska Heritage, but most of all because of you guys. I know that you have worked long and hard, and I know that the work has come at great personal expense to you. And each one of those cracks in that canoe that was healed the way you healed it, that carries all of the power, the strength, and the challenges that you put into this canoe. So know, know that we appreciate you. Know that our people will remember you. And like our culture, we also adapt. And I will tell you that this canoe is going to live on. It's going to have many children and grandchildren because we are going to make a mold of this and we are going to make more that we can spread out through our community. So know that your work, know that your work is going to throughout all of our communities and into our communities. So, Benochish, you are just wonderful and powerful guys. Thank you. I guess you can get back to work now. <laughs>I am of the Thunderbird clan. Akanian Kawa Luknahati Hasiti. My in laws are of the Koho Raven clan. Akhlis Kohas Sukahati Hasiti. My grandfather's people are of the Sukah Adi. Thank you for being here. Most noble children of the earth, thank you for allowing me to be with you this morning. Is what our ancient ones would say. It is so great to see how you represent your ancestors and how noble you are as ravens. Thank you so much. This blessing here with respect to this yak. Yak <laughs> Pluck one. Yak dot yake yake on the way. Haji yewuki. A long time ago, this vessel was a very valuable vessel to us as a people as we came up from the Nas and we settled this land. And some of the names of the community that I mentioned. Almost every one of the major communities in Southeast Alaska have been named by the Tlingit people. 
They were the inhabitants of this land. We look at it and we call it Tlingit Ani, Tlingit Ani Ashitka, Tlingit Ani Ashitka. Most noble people's land, Sitka. At Kukedi means there are lessons in this for us. A canoe is not just a vessel that goes over water. It represents a people's journey in life. The journey that we started thousands upon thousands of years ago. And we're still here on that journey. We are not gone. We are not lost. This is the land of our forefathers. And we have been on this journey for over 10,000 years. And as this canoe was being put together, I understand that the the people working on the canoe had some challenges as it related to the way it was coming together. That you had some challenges and difficulty. The Atkukedi is this for all Tlingit people. In life, there is no time where we don't have challenges as human beings. And the challenges you had in putting this together here and getting ready to do the work that you're going to do in completion demonstrates the power, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the determination not to quit, not to give up, but to be able to finish the work that you started. You're about to finish that. And that speaks in a lesson to all of us as Tlingit people. That the work we have before us is still with us. And we may face challenges and we may face opposition. But it's our job to complete what has been started even as this canoe has been started and will be completed. I can go on and on because of what the fire feels nice and warm right now. <laughs> but I'm not going to. I just want us to know that this canoe that you men have been working on and those of you that have helped getting this done will serve as a icon for us, for our future generations of what our people have come through in order to have this done. It's not just a vessel that you're going to travel on. It's a symbolic vessel that we are all on together. And now what I will do before the rocks are put in is what our Sunderbird people did a long time ago. And I was looking for my Thunderbird brother, but I don't see him here right now. So I guess I'm going to do this chant along with my sister Rosita here. Kahani, she's a Thunderbird as well. And so I know she's going to say a few words. And so here's a, here's a song that we, a chant that we did. And the chant when we did it, it was to take possession of. It was not giving it away. It was taking possession of, possession of our wisdom, possession of our knowledge, possession of our courage, possession of our vision, possession of a courage to continue on as a people, regardless of who may come and stand against us. And we say, nobody will stand against you, society in general has demonstrated where it is, and I'm not putting it down. But we have different values and different customs, so we're taking possession of it. And if you want to, you men that did this, stomp your feet because you're part of the blessing of what's happening. Thank you for the blessing. It goes like this.
Aren't you gonna speed? Okay, this will be our traditional thing, and then she'll speak afterwards, so. Thank you for your words. Welcome to our land. To our land, our And it's important that we respond to you in our Tlingit custom. We have to give balance. My Uncle Herman, who is our leader, Tleutuish, is not able to be here, so he sent me to speak for him as his nephew. And it's good that your words are not flying around now. We're going to capture cheese. them, and we're going to make sure that they're together with our own words. My Uncle Herman wanted to express to the artists, the carvers, and the helpers how much he appreciates this traditional canoe. He wanted to say Gunachish to all of you. I'll translate for TJ Hawa. Gunachish. <laughs> <laughs> That's another part of our custom is humor, and I know there's been a lot of humor around this canoe, this yak, and that's good for this community, this humor that we have. But I would like to respond in kind with a chant that my Aunt Jessie Johnny, my late Aunt Jessie Johnny, taught me, and she helped me with the words. This went with the kutia that was done over on Community Health Service Department on the island, the well variety told them. She says, use these words, hagu Oh, yeah. We're all working together. We're all moving forward. This is the way I feel today. I'm going to counter your song with this chant that she helped me with. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you, young men. I cannot tell you how much you mean to our people, how much you mean to our future, to our survival as a people. I am thinking that this canoe, this canoe represents our culture. You and our, this canoe represent our culture. At one point in time, this tree stood so tall and proud and strong on our land. That is the way that our culture was. It was strong, powerful, it allowed us to settle this land 10,000 years ago. It brought our people strength. But then these challenges came to our land. And this canoe represents that history that we went through as a people. There were cracks in this log. There were challenges that you had to face. But yet, like our ancestors, like the Kiksadi people, like the Flaknachadi, like the Sitkakwan people, who fought off those who would come to our land and try to take our land and try to take our culture. You prevailed, even with those challenges. You were the ones, your ancestors, your grandfathers, your grandmothers, they were the ones who withstood the challenges. No matter what people are celebrating now on this 150th anniversary, we could have a celebration of 10 years, 1,000 years of survival. 
And you artists, can you appreciate how important you are to us? You are important. You all of the artists. Where are the other artists who are here? You are important to us because you are the ones who carry the outward, outward symbols of our culture. You are the ones who make these things that are still imbued with the spirits of our ancestors. So you're so, you're powerful to us. And we owe gratitude also to those who might have come from the outside, but who are now one with us. Steve Brown, Steve Brown, who has the wisdom of our knowledge of our ancestors. He's written about it. And now he wants to return it back to us. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sitka Park, National Historic Park. They are also our partners in this project. We could not have done it without them, without Sea Alaska, without Sea Alaska Heritage, but most of all, because of you guys. I know that you have worked long and hard, and I know that the work has come at great personal expense to you. And each one of those cracks in that canoe that was healed the way you healed it, that carries all of the power, the strength, and the challenges that you put into this canoe. So know, know that we appreciate you. Know that our people will remember you. And like our culture, we also adapt. And I will tell you that this canoe is going to live on. It's going to have many children and grandchildren because we are going to make a mold of this and we are going to make more that we could spread out through our communities. So know that your work, know that your work is going to throughout all of our communities and into our futures. So, Benochish, you are just wonderful and powerful guy. Thank you. I guess you could get back to work now. <laughs> <laughs>
Smoke signals. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. 